Now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our chairman for today, uh, Mauricio Safdi uh, from the Family Office uh, SAF, who is the perfect gentleman to guide us through today's proceedings. Mauricio, if you'd like to join me on stage. Thank you very much. A big round of applause, Mauricio. Obrigado, Martin. Eu vou falar em português, está autorizado. Então, eu só queria agradecer mais uma vez a Terapins por essa maravilhosa organização, a qual já vem tendo desde cinco anos e com muito sucesso, cada vez mais. Agora parece bastante evidente que o Brasil está no radar de todo mundo, mas quando esses eventos começaram, eu me lembro ainda em 2005, o primeiro evento que a gente apoiou, uh, que não está, não era tão fácil trazer investidores e profissionais para a mesa, hoje já parece evidente. Uh, obrigado de novo, Martin, pelo convite. E eu gostaria de introduzir agora uh, o Dr. Joaquim Levi, do Bradesco Asset Management, para falar. Obrigado. I'm very happy to have you here. I cannot see all of you. The lights are very strong, but uh, it, it's good. And uh, what I, I'm, I would like to talk is a bit um, to give some background about what's happening in Brazil, why Brazil is in the radar, and of course some of the risks that you face if you decide to, to come to Brazil or increase your exposure as well as uh, some um, ways to really be uh, playing with Brazil and uh, using the capital markets of Brazil to get uh, sound exposure to all the good things that are happening. So, uh, basically when we travel abroad, what you see for good reason is that investors are concerned uh, with uh, their investment opportunities and uh, they want to go to a place where they can find returns but also uh, be, be safe. I think uh, safe assets are still in great demand and I think that Brazil really is a place where you can get both good returns, good prospects and uh, also to be in a safe place. Uh, but for many years, people who came to Brazil uh, would think as, as well, the commodities play and uh, an indirect, nice, easy way to get exposure to China and so on and so forth. Given what we've been reading the last few months about China and the obvious adjustment that China will have to go now that uh, they cannot continue to rely on foreign markets to grow and we all know that it's much more difficult to grow with our own domestic market than just by uh, getting more and more of, of uh, external market and given that some of the key external markets Europe and even the US are not growing that also means that China cannot keep expanding their market share in this um, these markets, um, growth will reduce, uh, be reduced in, in China. And what that means to Brazil? How much linked is Brazil to China? I think this is an important question that you have to face on uh, in a very straight way. And also, I think the answer to that is very much linked to the policies we have in Brazil and what that means to our own domestic market that has been so important for growth in the last uh, few years. And how are we going to support and ensure the continuation of this growth? And we all know that the answer, uh, part of the answer, a very important part of the answer, is what we do with the infrastructure. Uh, so that's basically what I want to address here. And then, because I believe that we are going to succeed to meet the challenge with infrastructure, and we are going to meet this challenge in part through public investment, in part through public spending, but in large part through uh, private investment and private companies, uh, I want to tell you a few ways uh, through which you can participate into that. 
Well, this is well known. What are the main drivers, the positive drivers, negative drivers? A bit of what I've been saying. Uh, we still, it's not only in Brazil, but have the growth middle class. And this dynamic, the more education technology is opening so many doors uh, to economies and lowering costs in a way that you're being able to pull so many people out of poverty. Uh, I think this will continue. This is a, is a trend for the next 20, 30 years, and Brazil is very much at the center of this trend. On the other hand, we do have some uh, drags. Uh, the immediate drag, of course, is the adjustment that Europe has to go through, whether it's aging, and particularly in China, and so on. How do we, uh, uh, say, sit in this environment? I think when you look to Brazil, not only we are now the sixth largest economy in the world, and pretty soon you may even overcome uh, France, depending on what they do in the next couple of years. We already, I mean, passed Spain, Italy, and, and so on. But also when you look in this universe of, of BRICS, uh, Brazil has the second largest economy among the BRICS. And when you look at, uh, uh, say, income levels, uh, per capita income levels, we are in the first. And that's very important because this means the type of product that the Brazilian economy, the Brazilian consumer really can buy. And this is important for those who are trading with us, for those who want to uh, get plants here, direct investment is also important for those who want to go through uh, capital markets because it means that you have a lot of local companies and listed companies that have a burgeoning market and a very solid one. Uh, in addition to that, we have, I mentioned the aging of China, it's very interesting to look where we, we, we are in this uh, variable too, because we hear a lot about India and uh, the demographic bonus and so on, which is true. But Brazil uh, also has a, a demographic that's pretty close of that of India. Um, and uh, I, I think that, of course, we all concern without uh, Social Security, and we have recently passed new reforms of Social Security for 20 years ahead. But the fact is that right now, and for the next 10 years, we have a very good demographics. And when you also consider the size of the economy, when you're talking about 200 million people, that's very powerful, that has a tremendous uh, impact on the ability to grow. And there, I think, is one of the reasons when I look to this question, What's going to happen if China really decelerates? Are we really just following this locomotive, this engine of, uh, of, uh, of China? Or you can have, I mean, all the bricks, the five bricks, can really have their own independent uh, nice uh, flight. I believe, uh, of course, the world is getting more and more interconnected, but you have a lot of things that give uh, ability for uh, we to continue to grow even if you see deceleration uh, in China. And there are a few reasons for that. The first one is that, of course, China, when you look, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the charts about uh, the, the share of exports of Brazil that go to China, and they have grown so much. They were like 3%, 2% a decade ago, and now you're talking about 17%. But still, if you compare that with so many other countries, uh, both um, middle-income countries like Mexico that has 80% of their trade just with one country, or Australia that has 75% uh, of their trade just in commodities. In the case of Brazil, we have a very broad-based uh, uh, um, export uh, selection of products and also of uh, partners. And this means that we can diversify our risks. And even if one falters, of course, if the world as a whole slows down, exports will, will come down. But China is important, but is not, uh, say, uh, absolutely uh, um, something that you go or break 
the Brazilian economy. If you think, for instance, you compare it with, uh, say, uh, Chile, it's a very different uh, game. In addition to that, and this is very important in the world where commodity price and all price go up and down, it does make a big difference if you have energy independence and you have food independence. We have seen them I in the Arab Spring, you have seen so many things because of changes in price. In Brazil, while well, price can come down and up and down, but we produce that domestic we don't have to worry about BOP problems. 30 years ago, we did have a problem with, the, with energy, and basically the debt crisis was a consequence of our dependence on the external foreign oil. Now, we don't have that, and that increases dramatically the flexibility of the economy. Just coming back to, to China, uh, here, a couple of exercises. First, uh, our breakdown not only by country or by region, but also by products. And you see that, yes, in China we have a very large share of primary goods. In the other markets, not so much. And of course, we, we face a stiff competition, for instance, manufacturing in Latin America and in other markets, third markets, that were a big provider as some of the Asian countries have diverted their export from Europe to these countries, but still, we can hold our ground. In addition to that, uh, there is this small exercise at the bottom um, about what would happen if the price of ore came to half. You just look at what was the share of total exports of Brazil, iron ore, to China meant 7% a little bit less than 8% of our exports uh, last year. So if you had that cut by half, this would decrease our overall export by 3.5%. Of course, you can think about second round effects and so on, but this gives the, 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 the extent to which we are directly linked to that. And also shows why you do say that the real action is in the domestic market. Look at the share of the GDP from the supply side. You see that the majority, almost two thirds, of our GDP are service, like in any developed company uh, economy. And we have a tiny part that are, it's mining, and then you have a tiny part, very important part, but like in the US, the US feeds the world, but agriculture means only 3% of GDP. Here it means more, 5% percent of GDP. But you do see that these not only reinforce the idea of the diversification of our industry. And mind you, if, if with the floating exchange rate, if there are adjustments in the exchange rate, our industry, I have no doubt, we, we have a big rebound. Um, and you look there, Brazil was like the fourth largest market, auto uh, car market, back in 2011, ahead of Germany, ahead of India, ahead of Russia, and all the other European countries. And most of that was produced in Brazil. You're talking about more than 3 million cars uh, produced. That's a lot. And now, because of some of the policies in Brazil, Asian companies are, and Chinese companies even, are thinking about exporting cars for, to Latin America, not from their own countries, but from Brazil. That's additional strength, additional diversification away from uh, commodities. And uh, of course, we have, I, I, I presume that all of you have heard about, well, increasing export, some of the complaints on industry. I don't know a country in the world where the industry doesn't think that the environment could be more favorable, and I think they're right. Uh, but in Brazil, we're hearing that, and yes, the imports have increased quite uh, significantly. If you look at the, the chart at your left at the top, what you're going to see is just we're having a catching up of imports. But our trade balance continue to be quite healthy. We still have a trade balance of uh, $30 billion. And we, the current account is negative, but I'm going to tell you a little secret that I'm sure many of you know, is that a large part of our uh, current account deficit is explained by remittances of profits to European companies. 
Just the automakers have sent $5 billion last year in profit to their companies. So when you look at our balance of payments, actually the fact that they have a deficit can be even seen as a strength. We have profits and people are sending their profits. Then they come back as capital, but then it's in another line. So it's a very interesting thing, but we have to look through the numbers and understand what's going on. And also, of course, this improvement in, in the increase in, in imports is explained in part by the improvement in, in terms of trades. We got richer. But this change is not as dramatic as in uh, some other countries. And I take the example of Chile. It's amazing. In the case of Chile, you see our terms of trade have risen by about 20%. Uh, 20%. That's very different from other countries. And I take the case of Chile, where this jump has been of 80%. So if you're talking about risks of adjustment, if there is a change in commodity prices, it's a whole different game if you're talking uh, Chile, Australia, or if you're talking uh, Brazil. And as you see, the last chart shows most of the, the drive of the economy uh, has been, again, domestic markets. You, you see uh, uh, at the bottom chart. Now compare that with, uh, with India. I'm very sorry there is no glass here, so I... You compare that with, with India, and it's quite remarkable that, yes, our trade balance has fluctuated, but if you see the line in China, that, that in India, that the lower line at the top chart, it's really going down all the way, okay? It's, and, and a large part of that is oil, and then it's also, quite interestingly, uh, it's steel. And again, uh, mineral, uh, iron ore, because, you know, they do have some iron ore, but it's not of high quality. And that's very important. And a lot of companies keep investing in, in, in increasing supply of iron ore in Brazil, even with the slowdown of China, because India will be a big thing in the next 10, 15 years when you do have all this urbanization there. I think urbanization in India can be even stronger than in China. They're, they want to have like 300 million people going to town. And that will increase the demand for for steel and then for iron ore dramatically. So again, this is a second cushion, a second buffer if something happens uh, to, to, uh, to China. But in addition, what I want to show here is that the fact that you have a trade balance that fluctuates and in the case of India really comes down does not necessarily spell trouble. In the case of India in particular, I don't know if you can see in the chart, they are compensated in part by uh, remittances, by workers. They have Indians all over the world in the, in the Gulf states and so on that send money, and also it's uh, almost 2% of GDP now of exports of, of software services. Um, so I, I, what you can see is that the risks from outside do exist, but are not overwhelming. In addition to that, we do have a strong domestic market, and it didn't happen by chance. It's a consequence of now 20 years of progress, of reforms, of good macroeconomic management in Brazil, and starting with fiscal policies. And what we see, as I go very quickly over some of these charts, is what you all know. For many years, Brazil has had a very stable and strong fiscal policy, which has meant, as you see there at the chart left at the top, uh, our total deficit has uh, decreased from about 5% of GDP now to about 2% of GDP and sometimes even less than that. Uh, and as a consequence, our public debt as percentage of GDP keeps falling and will be in the mid-30s in a couple of, of years. Now, if you compare that, it's a very small chart, but if you compare that with other countries, which you see at the bottom uh, left, we are very close to where the Netherlands is in terms of public debt. On the other hand, uh, we, in terms of public deficit, we are quite ahead of them. If you look at the, the chart here at the right at the top, Netherlands will be pretty much to, to the left. 
and, uh, and, and here, this is why here we don't have to worry about Mantega or, or the government because actually not only have our public debt in good shape, but also the flows and the, and the uh, fiscal deficit is also doing quite well. An important thing is that we see here in a, just a, a, say a snapshot, I think many of the factors that have led to this big increase in the middle class. We all know by now that what used to be like 30% of the population has grown to 53, 55% of the population is in the middle class, what in Brazil the marketing people call the C class. Okay, and uh, uh, what is behind that? Is it credit? Well, it's in part credit that has given them purchasing power. But it's much more than that. I think it's like 10 years of job creation. For 10 years now, we had an average or one and a half million new jobs a year. Uh, I, when I was in the government back in 2003 and so on, I used to keep tabs with job creation in the U.S. And then, of course, there was a problem with the series in the U.S. And uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I start to miss the point. And now, when I see the recovery at 150,000 uh, new jobs a month, that's more or less what you get in Brazil. But mind you, the workforce in the U.S. is almost twice as big as it is in Brazil, but we are growing, we are generating as many jobs almost uh, as the US, and they are in a recovery from uh, losing several million jobs, while you see here we had positive job creation for more than 10 years, and you continue in this space with about one million, one million and a half jobs. Jobs are the way to bring people to the middle class. It's not through credit, it's not through Bolsa Familia. Bolsa Familia has a tremendous impact in the very poor uh, part of the population, but jobs is what behind the growth of the economy. And you see the, the chart at the right, at the top, you see that indebtedness of households in Brazil is still quite low. And even if you compare, for instance, a country like Chile, Chile has a debt to GDP uh, credit, a bank credit to GDP of about 60 to 70 percent. We are talking about less than 50 percent. So even if you compare with our peers in Latin America, which you have a long way to go without having major risks. Also because our banks are among the most uh, robust in the world. This is a little bit technical, but I think it's worth looking into. Uh, what I have here is a sort of a uh, balance sheet of banks. And what I see in Brazilian banks is that, yes, they do have some foreign liabilities, uh, 269 billion reais. But they not only have also foreign assets, uh, topping 190 billion reais, so which leave a very uh, small net liability. But in addition to that, they have two cautions. One, they have reserve requirements that are among the highest in the world. You have 440 billion uh, reais in reserve requirements. What does that mean? That means they, this is money that is locked in the central bank and that can be freed at any time. So banks can, uh, uh, if they have to reduce their uh, liabilities, they can still uh, continue to lend because it's just for the central bank, bank to free this money. So you don't have a risk of credit crunch. Moreover, there you have the ability to buy uh, the, the foreign currency to pay uh, these liabilities because, as you know, and I think there will be a chart, we have more than $300 billion uh, in uh, international reserves. So you have the money the, the, in domestic currency, in the banking system, even if there is uh, any problem with the financing, with the lending, and we have the, 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 the foreign currency and the central bank to pay that. That means that if you, even if you have a problem financing, uh, 
big financial crisis, our banks can be protected and we will not have a major credit crunch in, in Brazil. And that, of course, is fundamental for companies to know that they will be able to continue to run even in a very uh, 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 troublesome environment. Okay, you probably by this time say, well, uh, Joaquim is telling that everything's fine in Brazil, there are a few risks here and there, but nothing to worry about. So what's left to be done in Brazil? Well, a lot is left to be done in Brazil. We do have, we still have structural challenges. First, of course, we, we have been able to stabilize our tax burden, but for the level of development we are, it's still high. And in part, we are in a cyclical uh, upswing, so the fact that we stabilize our, our um, um, our tax burden is not so reassuring. And this is why, from time to time, we think about why we don't have a structural fiscal account. It's not a trivial thing to do, but at least the principle is important to keep in mind. Uh, but I believe that this is something that the government has understood. And if you look in the last few years, we have not had any new tax, except what is called regulatory tax. They may raise a tax to offset some apparent distortion in prices, like the UF or things like this. But otherwise, we've been able to deliver a very hefty, uh, say, fiscal balance without having to resort to tax increase. If you look back 15 years ago, we had to increase because before 94, we had the inflation tax. So with a 25% of GDP tax burden, the rest will be senior age and so on and so forth. Then just after the, the Plano Real, it took a while, it took four or five years for people really to raise the tax and this is why we actually had the crisis in 98. The second big challenge, of course, is education. It's true that you have at any point in time more than five million students in universities in Brazil. It's true that uh, universities are such a good business in Brazil that uh, there are a lot of listed companies that are in this field and they don't leave out of, uh, uh, say, checks from the government. Uh, they do leave uh, uh, thanks to the money that people pay from their own pockets. So they have to deliver quality. But still, when you look at the average uh, years of schooling in Brazil, we are not in the top in the world, not even the top among the BRICS. So I think this is a major challenge. And the good thing is that because you don't have to worry about macro problems anymore, government, people, society is really devoting much more uh, energy and effort to overcome this challenge. And also, investment levels in Brazil have not been that high, and they are increasing, and we believe they're going to increase, but it's a, another big challenge. But fortunately, this is a challenge that you can help uh, overcoming. Of course, um, we have got so far uh, with some success because we've been able to keep adjusting the economy, we've been able to have reforms in a very steady way. Even today, maybe because of this conference, I don't know, uh, Congress has just voted a very important change in taxation for VAT. And there was a distortion in VAT that would favor imports against domestic production. And um, well, through a lot of negotiations, this is a, a federative issue. Mind you, this affects every one of the 27 states, but Congress was able to harness all the, the consensus, all the political uh, energy to uh, face this problem. And uh, reducing the distortion of G VAT is important not only in the short term uh, to, to give a boost to industry, but also you reduce all sorts of distortion in terms also of location of new investments. So the list is very long. I'm not going to, uh, through all of them, but uh, I think, as you see, it continues to 11, to 12. Uh, it, it does continue uh, uh, to have changes. And I think the important message is that all these little seeds and the uh, uh, small trees that have been planted in the last 15 years, they are blossoming now. And how is this happening? I take here the example of three areas. Um, one is telecom, huge sector. 
You're talking about revenues of a hundred billion dollars a year. What you see is a new drive of investment. Of course, there are uh, innovations. So 4G, there will be now the auction of the 4G frequency in June. And uh, since last year, uh, the Ministry of Communications really revamping the regulation, opening new opportunities to private sector. There was, I don't know if you saw the last line on the previous page, there's this reform of uh, everything that's related to cable TV and uh, um, internet and so on, allowing to have much more of a cross investment uh, there. And uh, also you see, in addition to the big companies, we see a lot of uh, new entrants, some of them listed, but that, that uh, provide a tremendous diversity of, uh, of alternatives to, to investors. We have uh, and Gen T and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a sector, uh, already Brazil is the fourth largest market in terms of uh, cellular phone. We don't hear so much about what's going on in this industry, but I can tell you people do a lot of things through uh, their funds. And in the case of Bradesco, you can do like in India or any other country, do a lot of your, say, banking activities through uh, cell funds, and this is moving faster and faster. And because of the reforms, you also see a big change, not only in the mobile industry, but also in the fixed internet broadband. Huge investments are happening now. And then, like you mentioned, this fact that you gave more flexibility and allowed firms that are in the, the telephone business also to operate in the, in the cable TV business. This is increasing uh, also the market for pay TV. I mean, we don't hear so much about that when you talk in, the, uh, say, academic forums or among economists. But when you're talking about real business, this is what uh, really drives it. When you see markets growing 30% year on year, when you see numbers that uh, you have penetration and that you rise to 50% of households having uh, broadband, uh, internet, well, this does change. You see, five, ten years ago, the big thing in Brazil was land houses. And nowadays, you don't have so much land house for two reasons. Most of the urban dwellings already have some sort of direct access. I mean, computers are so cheap, also in Brazil, and I didn't put in the list of the reforms, but one was the change of taxation of, uh, of computers back in 2004, uh, that they don't need that. And also because smartphones are getting more and more smart uh, and people can afford. So you get the new generation, these young people with much more education and access to all of that. It does change. And I think for foreigners that may not sound so surprising, but for us Brazilians, we, it's so, such a big change that it's hard sometimes to get the full extension of it. Um, but they don't happen by chance. As I mentioned, the, the, the Ministry of Communication in the last year and a half has had a very consistent plan to boost investment, infrastructure. They have changed for the regulation uh, between those who operate uh, the, the service and those who invest in infrastructure. So you get different types of capital with different lands, different investment horizon participating in, in, in this expansion. Um, so fiber optic is going to grow dramatically all over the country. And this is what is bring so many new consumers. And uh, also companies, for a number of reasons, are responding to that. So uh, at the beginning, 95, in 2000, telecoms were the big players in the stock market. And then they basically almost disappeared. And they have realized that, and in part because of the new possibilities, and yes, uh, Olympic Games, uh, World Cup also give a buzz to that. They've been changing their governance. And markets are responding to that. You do see, if you look at the last year, what a magnificent uh, uh, rebounding in the stock prices of these companies, in large part because of the transformation and the way they operate, the way they relate to investors. That's it's really the 
typical example of how the, the market in Brazil is evolving. Another sector that's not so much talked is railways. And it's true that in Brazil we still have too much of our uh, freight on trucks. The fact is that since privatization of railways, you have seen a consistent investment by companies, some of closed companies, you have a fantastic company, MES, you have ALL that's listed, how many billions they have improved there. And this, as in many countries actually, is a sector that's a bit overlooked. And why? Because it works. Why? Because you keep seeing a steady increase in freight transported by railroads. You don't see the long queues of trucks in front of ports. That was a hallmark of Brazil, uh, say, 15 years ago. And the government is now also coming to invest its own and is also uh, using what you have in Europe, for instance, where the, the investment in the, the rail uh, itself, the line, is, is done by the government and then uh, is, there is an open access to this line so you get more operators. And this is the trend you're seeing now. And, uh, and uh, the beautiful thing is that you can say, well, this will increase competition, is good for the country, might not be good for the companies. I think companies are adjusting to that. They're happy. And you, what you also see, like so many, in so many cases in Brazil, a lot of uh, ingenuity. So you do see a lot of big companies like Coza, which is a listed company too, uh, with Shell and, uh, and Sugar, they are putting their own money to uh, improve some of the lines and making partnership with ALL and so on, so that you get more and more investment in, in this sector. Again, I think this is a very good example of a quiet transformation of a sector and a story that investors can participate through the stock market, in particular through LLL, but I mean some, uh, some of the roads are also through CSCNE or even Valley, that's kind of a dormant Ray Array FCA, but I'm sure they, with the new administration they even are, uh, say restarting some uh, of the lines. There is a disagreement with Ike Batista, which can be a, a very a good sign. And of course there are ports. I'm not going to, to say much about that. The only things again is something started back in the 93. Uh, you see them grow and grow and you see so much investment in Santos and, and a lot of private terminals also throughout the coast. Some tiny, some large. Uh, a real transformation of infrastructure and one that I see that uh, the government is now getting a new look because the initial concessions will run out uh, next year and I think it will also open up for uh, private investment not only through direct investment but also through uh, capital markets. So I'm quite bullish and again there are two companies, uh, Santos and uh, Wilson Sons that had had fantastic runs in, in their prices in the last year. I mean, you're talking about, again, jumps of 30% of equity price in a world where you see um, the equity prices as a whole uh, so much, um, I mean, uh, going sideways. And then there are airports where we, we also see uh, new entrants, and I think these guys, you need more capital. BNDES now is doing, giving them a lot, but uh, private investors will also be invited to help with that. We got three, we likely maybe late this year, early next year, get Rio, you get Minas, Confins, and I think it will be, again be a big transportation, uh, a big transformation on that. Well, I've been talking about companies that involved the debt. And so the, the, the natural answer is say, okay, but how big are these companies? I tell you, they add to almost $300 billion. That's a lot of money. It's not only an important share, the total Ibovespa, but it's also, and here it's tiny letters, but you have 60 companies, and here listed only companies that are above a certain threshold of liquidity. Okay, and you have these in many, many sectors you have there. And to give an idea what it means, 300 billion, I, we put together this little table. We compare the infrastructure sector 
listed companies in Brazil with a lot of liquidity, with the whole market, the whole index of several countries. In Latin America, you see Mexico, you see Chile, the whole stock exchange of Chile is less than what you have in infrastructure in Brazil. So why I'm saying that? Because it's great to go through private equity. It's great to have one specific project. But in this world, when you think public equities and the liquidity they get you get in public equity and so on, I mean, just to know that in Brazil, one of the most thriving sectors is so huge and has so much opportunity, I think is a very important news. And uh, I compare also with Asia, and uh, it's not in the table, but I, I also mentioned, I mean, you, you think about Turkey, you think about uh, Poland, I know some of you are familiar with that, whole, again, whole stock market, you're talking about 200 billion less than the infrastructure sector in Brazil. And the beauty of it, and going back to what I was talking so long ago when I started, was you think, why are these guys talking about that? Because if you're worried about China, if you're worried about exports, if you're worried about uh, the, the globe as a whole, but you believe in the domestic market in Brazil, well, that's pretty good. Uh, here what we did, we, we, we put all the sectors okay, in our stock exchange. And the, the bar, the yellow and the blue bars, is the market capitalization of these different uh, sectors in the Ibo Vespa. And what you see is that financial is about 25%, and then you have oil, and then you have value. Okay, when you, you, you go to infrastructure, you don't have finance, and you have this left side of the chart, and you're talking about electricity, you're talking about logistics, you're talking about transportation, telecom, uh, you're talking about also companies that supply uh, machinery, that supply engineering, that supply things that are linked to infrastructure. And these are uh, companies that have been growing steadily in the last few years, and you see everything that's going in terms of 4G, in terms of uh, um, even electricity, where we don't talk much, but the demand continues to grow by 3-5% a year. Okay, That means when you, if you believe in fundamentals and you do the cash flow, I mean, it's easy to get convinced that there is a lot of value and growth there. And actually, when you look at the last few uh, months, and especially uh, since the beginning of the government and the current administration, it is striking that how much separation you had between the red line and the dark line. The red line is exactly this, basically that universe of uh, infrastructure uh, companies. And each time the government reinforces its option to rely on public company, uh, private companies and concessions to move ahead with this huge investment plan. We do see new opportunities to these companies. You see this, the, the prospect of growth, okay? And you, the, the reaction of that, as market get more and more aware of that, is that there is this separation between the overall index that has oil, that has value, that has even financial, unfortunately, uh, for the prices, not uh, to be in the index, it's very good that they are in the index, and um, infrastructure. So it is a very strong case. And uh, I mean, I, I don't like to overdo uh, or exaggerate uh, possibilities, but they are there. And a final thought, very important one. I have been focusing on the equity side to show you that these are very well established companies. That they're big, but they deliver, and they have growth potential in spite of being big. But the other thing is that we are now moving to a second phase, which will be that of credit. So we're opening, uh, and the government is opening, uh, a whole uh, new universe of possibilities of investment through uh, the issuance of the ventures and the receivable funds that will actually finance the bulk of this uh, investment in the coming months. As I mentioned in the bottom, um, the 
The first issue under this new framework is already in the market. It will be uh, closed. Uh, the, the book will be closed, I think, this week or ne early next week. And I, from what I see, so far has been quite successful. And final thought. Uh, to get into that, all of these opportunities, taking into consideration uh, the, the, the strength of the domestic market and how this is the domestic market will be able to face even the major slowdown of China. I think that in Brazil we have one of the best asset management industry in the world in terms of transparency, in terms of governance, in terms of, of uh, financial infrastructure. So, uh, and this is a way that people can modulate their exposure to these opportunities, but also these risks. So, I, the only thing I can say is that yes, skies are overcast in the in, around the world. But frankly, from our vantage point, I think that uh, it's not as dark in in Brazil. And uh, I really take this opportunity to invite all of you who are considering new uh, alternatives of investment to come and to invest in a, in a sunny place like Brazil, where I'm sure there are so many opportunities at such a strong uh, capital market. Thank you very much. Thank you.